What an honor it is to be with you today. And Dr. and Mrs. Sloan, oh my goodness, I love being here with the two of you. We have the most fun story about Dr. Sloan. He was our interim pastor many years ago, probably 35-ish years ago. And we, our kids loved him. They didn't want to go to Bible study. They wanted to go hear Dr. Sloan teach, especially our youngest, Kristen, who just absolutely adored him. And so time was up, and we were uh, voting on a new pastor, and we're in church, and they say, all in favor, aye. All opposed, Kristen Hendy put her hand up and said, nay. And Ed looked at her and said, oh my gosh, Kristen, she said, no, no, I like Dr. Sloan. I love his teaching. I don't want the new guy. Oh, glory. <laughs> so this is the same child at Tallawood. We visited Tallawood for the first time because our daughter Lisa had been hospitalized at Memorial City with a staph infection. And she was in the hospital from late June to early August with a staph infection, and we got a day pass, and we visited Talwood, and said they were lovely. We, we'd never been in a Baptist church. <laughs> we're in the restaurant business. We had a little happy hour at the restaurant, and we were a little nervous about visiting. You know. And so we go in, and they take us to all the classes, and they, uh, we took Kristen to the three-year-old class, and after class, after worship, we went to pick her up and the teachers were standing out front and the man looked at Ed and said, excuse me, what do you all do? And Ed said, well, we own the Taste of Texas restaurant. And the guy said, oh, that makes sense. Your three-year-old made margaritas for the entire three-year-old Sunday school class not just margaritas, friends. She said, do you need more triple sec in that? <laughs> My gosh. So Dr. Sloan, see, we love you so much. We've got a long history of Hindi's loving you a lot. I'm just so honored to be here today to talk about Texas. It, I just, I'm obsessed with the freedom that is in this place. We're a unique place, but friends, we're not a perfect place. So the history of Texas is amazing. Not a perfect history, but it is something that we must continue to teach. So years ago, when we opened the Taste, 46 years ago, <laughs> which, uh, by the way, is why we twitch, um, we opened, and I love Texas, and we started this Texas theme, and then we started collecting documents, and we started hosting fourth graders. And we think, conservatively, we've had 400,000 fourth graders through the Taste of Texas. A lot of, a lot of chicken tenders, it really is. And we put them in the freezer, and we teach Texas. So we've collected this really wonderful Texas Museum, uh, the signature of Moses Austin, which I absolutely love, because Moses Austin loved the Lord our God with all of his heart. There is no evidence that Stephen Fuller Austin, his son, knew the Lord. Hmm, that's a shame. Moses Austin built the roof on Monticello for Thomas Jefferson our third president, and it leaked, and they ran him out of town. <laughs> yeah, they deserve to. And he came to Texas looking for a job because of the Panic of 1819. The world was broke. He wanders through Texas, and the rest is history. Moses Austin was amazing. His son, Stephen Fuller Austin, managed to bring that first permanent settlement to Texas when, friends, we were vastly unpopulated. Most accounts say less than 2,000 souls lived in Texas in 1818 because of a cholera epidemic, followed by, which is often the case, a yellow fever epidemic. 
So we're a half a million square miles, less than 2,000 people, including all of our native tribes. So Stephen F. Austin took up his father's plan to bring settlement, permanent settlement. They're called the old 300. A little Texas fact, there were only 297. <laughs> they will not call themselves the old 297. I don't blame them. So um, we, we have the signature of Moses Austin to show the children. So the kids come in and we show them the documents and they go, oh, that person actually signed that document. Stephen F. Austin actually signed that document with the signature of Jane Long in the restaurant. And Jane Long was a phenomenal woman. She survived Texas against all odds when Texas was really one of the wildest places on earth. She survived alone because her husband, Dr. James Long, went on the long expedition, did not return, and she survived a very harsh winter when Galveston Bay had ice. She survived the Karankawa. She had tiny children. She had a baby that was three months old, and she survived. Jane Long is also known for something that I particularly love. She's known for her hospitality. I love that. She welcomed all people into her boarding house in Richmond, Texas. She was a respecter of all persons. She welcomed everyone that came past her boarding house. Wow, a remarkable woman, Jane Long. Um, we've also collected the signature of Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Who, friends, I studied him most of my life. Um, he was a fascinating character. He was a brilliant military man. Um, and he came to power in Mexico promising to restore the Mexican Constitution, and he, in fact, burned the Constitution. He was Castilian royalty, Spanish royalty royalty born in St. Louis Potosi. Several years ago, we took a bunch of our grandchildren kind of on a Mexican independence tour. You took your grandchildren to the beach. <laughs> and we were in San Miguel de Allende, and we had this guy taking us through a brilliant Mexican historian. And I asked him a question about Santana. I said, do you think he really managed to murder 30,000 people in Mexico when he first came to power. And the man looked at us and he went, oh, he just went off. He said, absolute misinformation, revisionist history. How does this happen? Rewriting the history of our great Mexico. And I said, whoa, 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 just tell us. We're here to learn, tell us. And he, he said, started 100,000 Mexican citizens. He was a cruel dictator. Friends, today we have totally revised history. And I had a little school teacher. We had 161 schools last year through the Taste of Texas. And this little school teacher stood up and said, how dare you disparage Antonio Lopez de Santana, the hero to these Mexican children. And I went, wait, what did you say? He's the cruelest person that's ever ruled Mexico. Ruled 51 years, fell from power 11 times, slaughtered the people of Mexico. He was despised by the people of Mexico. We have his signature, we have his document in the restaurant. Um, we also have several uh, signatures of Sam Houston. We have eight, but we have a little small problem. We have 12 grandchildren. <laughs> we have a signature of Sam that says, I am Houston. So Sam Houston was so proud of the fact that the Allen brothers were going to name our city Houston that he distinctly changed his name to where when he met you, he would shake your hand and say, I am. Houston. It's a little bit arrogant, but guess what happened to Sam? 
Sam had a wife that prayed without ceasing, a remarkable woman, Margaret Lee Houston. She never stopped praying for her husband. She prayed for 17 years. Sam was called the big drunk. He was called the raven. He was a hot mess. And then he married Margaret Lee Houston, and she was a woman that prayed. But friends, she didn't just pray. She prayed for him to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Her letters to him, if you want a wonderful book, the letters of Margaret Lee Houston to Sam Houston. It's called Sam Houston's Wife. She never judged. She never criticized. She just shared Jesus over and over with a loving heart. 17 years after she started praying, Sam Houston came to know the Lord. Dr. Rufus Burleson, the second president of Baylor, baptized Sam Houston in the Rocky Creek in Independence, Texas. Now, he was bigger than life. The average male in 1836 was 5'6". That was pre actually pretty tall. Sam Houston was 6'6". Six six. So when he was baptized, they had three pastors in the water for Sam. <laughs> Do you blame them? Let's not drop the big guy. So they lowered him into the water of the, independent, of the Rocky Creek in Independence, brought him out of the water, and he looked at Dr. Burles, and he said, oh, I pity the poor fish downstream. <laughs> know about killing a few schools myself. They said Sam Houston didn't even look like the same person. A new creature in Christ. Wow. Dr. Rufus Burleson was an amazing man. I have an I Am Houston signature in our Texas Museum. I also have the signature of Benjamin Milam, and it's probably the hardest document we've ever come by, except a few weeks ago I was uh, bidding on a document signed by the Baron of Bastrop, and I lost, but I was, I need, the Benjamin Milam document, and I look at it often and say, it's for the children. <laughs> He's like, you're yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. And so a Benjamin Milam document was coming up for auction, and we, we talk about all of them and whether we really need it and whether it's really important. Um, and so Ed said, well, what will that cost and I said well it's probably worth eight to ten thousand dollars but I need it for the children and he said Go, you need it no one has a Benjamin Milam signature because he didn't sign much of anything so he said go all the way up to twenty five thousand dollars you will never have to buy me another gift as long as you live <laughs> And so the auction started, and um, I'm sitting at the computer, and I'm bidding, and I'm bidding, and in four and a half minutes, it was at $63,000, because I was bidding against Phil Collins, <laughs> largest collector of Texas history. The man owns more Alamo artifacts than the Alamo. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. He's from Great Britain. Excuse me? What is his fascination? When you ask him, he says one word, freedom. Friends, this is about freedom. Phil Collins understands. So I didn't get the Benjamin Milam document, and about three years ago, uh, or four years ago, I was speaking to the Houston area FBI agents, and this man came up to me after the speech, and he said, I'm a Benjamin Milam descendant. You are? He said, yes, and I have documents, and if you'd like to buy one, I will sell you a Benjamin Milam document. I have a Benjamin Milam document. It's for the children. I also have an Alamo cannon, a little four-pound Alamo cannon. It is amazing, it weighs 80 pounds. It is very interesting because it was uncovered in the San Antonio River 
just off of the north wall of the Alamo when the Works Progress Administration started building the Riverwalk. They uncovered all these Spanish cannons, and we have one. <laughs> of the signature of David Crockett. David Crockett loved the Lord our God with a passion. He loved the Lord. David Crockett, United States Congressman from Tennessee that was not reelected to the uh, to Congress in the August elections of 1835 because he got crosswise with our seventh president, Andrew Jackson, over the native issue. Jackson said, annihilate the natives. And uh, Crockett said, give them their land and leave them alone. So he wasn't reelected. So he was furious. That's when he made that famous statement, to heck with you, I'm going to Texas. That's not exactly verbatim, but <laughs> Crockett was incredible. So years ago, my family gave me a David Crockett signature for Mother's Day. And it was Mother's Day morning, you know, we go to work, we work, 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 we were in a hurry, they had made beautiful breakfast, and I opened a card from the kids, and inside of the card was the signature of David Crockett. And so what do I do? What do I do? I cry. I sit at the breakfast table weeping over the Crockett signature, and Kristen was about 10 at that time, and Kristen looked at Ed, and she said, Dad, I told you Mom wanted a purse. <laughs> I want a purse. I got a David Crockett. And that was during the, some of these ladies will remember, you remember the Dooney and Burke craze? Everyone needed a Dooney and Burke. I got a David Crockett did not need a Dooney and Burke. A year ago, this past September, September of 22, I received a phone call. I received a phone call from an auction house, and they were in Kentucky, and they said, you are being invited to bid on one of the most significant parts of Texas history that's ever come up for auction. I said, I'm in. What is it? And they said, well, we can't tell you. Um, we'll tell you in a couple of weeks. There will be four private bidders, one being the Alamo. And the, I don't know how they found me, but they um, started this interview process. They called some of the schools that have been through the Taste of Texas for 40 years to make sure we really teach about Texas and so the bidding started and it goes on for four months and the night before the bid ended I looked at my sweet precious tolerant husband and I said we can sell the house <laughs> I need it you don't need it and it is the interior doors of the Alamo Chapel It is. It still makes me weep. We've had them a year next week. A year next week. The Alamo was surrounded. 189 defenders from 13 countries fighting for your freedom against one of the most brutal men that has ever lived in the history of time. And they knew they would die. The Alamo was surrounded by 6,000 of Santana's well-trained Napoleonic soldiers. Don't you know they were terrified? They were people just like us that loved the Lord, that prayed without ceasing, but they knew they would die. Travis's last letter says it all. Victory or death, freedom's not free has never been free, will never be free. Victory or death. And then the P.S. is the best. P.S. The Lord is on our side. David Crockett died. Crockett was the world's first celebrity. We get a lot of really fun people in the Taste of Texas because we've been open a long time and we've got some really fun items and the food is wonderful and we've had several heads of state like five or six heads maybe seven heads of state that's a real pain 
We, <laughs> that's exhausting. <laughs> but two years ago, I received a phone call from the State Department, and they said, we have a head of state coming to MD Anderson. And it's very, very quiet, but he is insisting he needs to come to the Taste of Texas. And I said, well, that's wonderful. We're delighted. And they said, it's very, very quiet. And it will just be his security team because he wants to see the signature of David Crockett. So I had the privilege of taking this man on a tour the night before he checked in to MD Anderson Hospital. We got to the Crockett signature, friends, and he knew more about David Crockett, Crockett's love of the Lord. He knew how many votes that Crockett lost by in the August elections of 1835, going back to 10. He knew about the feud with Andrew Jackson. And I said, why? Why? How? Do you love this? He loved all of Texas. And he said, oh, wait, one word. What is that word? Freedom. Texas is the freest place on earth, and we so take it for granted. Crockett died. He was willing to die. He rushed through the doors of the Alamo Chapel and recommitted his life to Jesus Christ right before the Alamo fell. Susanna, Susanna, Susanna Dickinson was there. Um, James Bowie was there. Bowie's famous for the knife that we call the Bowie knife, but it, it's a Bowie knife. And he's not my favorite person in all of Texas history. I'm thinking about canceling him. <laughs> can work both ways, you know. It can. I'm thinking about canceling Bowie. He's famous for the knife that he did not invent. His brother did. He took full credit for it, which is how, how he would. He didn't invent the knife. His brother Rezin did, but we had a big knife, and he kept cutting his thumb. We know about cuts. Ooh. Bowie would cut his thumb. His right thumb was lame, and his brother kept trying to reattach the right thumb of James Bowie, and Resin Bowie took the knife to the family blacksmith and said, uh, could you put something that would keep his thumb on? And it made it the most famous knife in the world, but it was invented by Resin Bowie. We actually went to Mexico City years ago to see the Bowie knife. Uh, the Mexican government allowed it to come to Texas, and it was here for one year, which was amazing. Bowie was dying. He gave up command to William Bar Travis. Travis's line in the sand is great controversy. Did it really happen? Well, Susanna Dickinson was there, and she talked about the men carrying Bowie because he could not walk over the line in the sand. They knew they would die. Susanna Dickinson lived. She heard it all. Her husband, Almiron Dickinson, had the largest cannon just off of the east wall of the Alamo in the chapel. And she listened. Almiron Dickinson came through the door and said, Susanna, Susanna, all is lost. Take care of our child. The north wall has been breached. Don't you know she was terrified? Oh my goodness, she listened. She was 19 years old. Her baby Angelina Dickinson was in her lap. Travis had given Angelina, baby Angelina, the ring off of his hand the day before, knowing that they would die. And die they did. Susanna Dickinson lived. The next day on March the 7th, Santana called for her to be brought to him. He gave her a letter to Sam Houston, who was in Gonzales, 82 miles away, and said, go and tell what will happen if, we are, if I am opposed. Her life completely went into meltdown. Don't you know she had 
PTSD. She's 19 years old, a widow, penniless, no means. Oh, she was a mess. She married way too soon. She married her second husband in 1837, and it was a disaster. He beat her. He was arrested. He beat the child. She divorced. Wait a minute. You did not do that in 1837. She married a third time way too quickly. That husband died. She married a fourth time. She was a mess. She made her way to Houston. She was going to help with the cholera epidemic. And she met a man that shared the saving grace of Jesus Christ. His name was Dr. Rufus Burleson. Dr. Burleson led Susanna Dickinson to the Lord. She was baptized in the Buffalo Bio <laughs> by Rufus Burleson. She was, my friends, a new creature in Christ. She didn't even look like the same person. She married a fifth time. We were in the Susanna Dickinson home in Austin yesterday. She was married to her husband, her fifth husband, her entire life. She lived a life, wait a minute, of peace. Peace that passes all understanding. Because true freedom is Jesus Christ. She came to know the Lord, and her life was a, a, an amazing life. We live in an incredible place. The Alamo fell. The Texian defenders went on to San Jacinto after the massacre of Goliad. The Battle of San Jacinto is a story that is worth telling and retelling over and over again because it changed the world. Texas became a nation. Sam Houston made a decision that changed the world. He decided to attack at San Jacinto in broad daylight. That was against the law. The Articles of War, the Geneva Convention said you attack under cover of darkness. The Battle of San Jacinto changed it all. It's called the 11th most influential battle in the history of the, wait a minute, world? San Jacinto changed the world, and it was over in 18 minutes. Sam Houston made a decision that changed the world. He came to that fork in the road that we all come to. Are we going to take the easy road or the hard road? And oof, the hard road is tough. He was coming face to face with Santana. So on April the 21st of 1836, at 3.30 in the afternoon, Sam Houston camped only a mile away from Santana. They both had 800 soldiers. And Sam Houston said, remember the Alamo. Sir Winston Churchill had two books on his desk in the Churchill war rooms when London was being bombed. One was the story of San Jacinto. The other was the Bible. And it was over. And we became a nation. We became a nation because no one would have us. <laughs> you cannot blame them, people. <laughs> Texas was a mess. Texas had slavery. Texas had war debt. Texas had the wildest people on earth. Five times the United States Congress voted no to Texas becoming a state. Five times in 10 years, they said never. It is not going to happen. On the sixth vote, you ready? It happened in the middle of the night in Washington, D.C. Nothing good happens in Washington, D.C. <laughs> in the middle of, the, oh, actually, in the middle of the day, no. 2.30 in the morning, by one vote in Congress, Texas snuck in the back door of the United States by ratification of Treaty of Annexation. They wouldn't let us in the front door, so we snuck in the back door. Take that by one boat. 
the following spring, the ceremony took place. And a person that I consider to be one of my dearest friends in my world is Dr. Stuart Morris. We have shared a love of history. We talk history. We cry over history, American history, Texas history. But Dr. Morris knows his history. So we talk about Texas all the time. And um, Lisa gave me something several years ago that is from one of Stewart's relatives. So it's Judge William H. Stewart. And he was present in Austin on the day that Texas became the 28th state. And so I love eyewitness history. I do not read anything that was not primary source history because of rewriting of our history. So this is from Stewart's relative that was present on the day we became the 28th state. In December of 1845, Texas was annexed to the United States by an act of Congress. And the following spring, the formal ceremonies took place at Austin, whereby the government of the Texas Republic lapsed and ended. There were two or 3,000 persons at Austin when that ceremony took place. It was a wonderfully impressive scene. After prayer, the president of Texas, Anson Jones, delivered a speech. It was a strong and vivid review of the trials, the privations, and the triumphs of those early settlers of Texas, of the making of our republic, of the war with Mexico, of the tragedy of that war, and so on through the 10 years of the life of the republic. Then he told of the movement to annex Texas to the United States, of the ratification of that treaty of annexation, and of the purpose why the people were gathered, congregated at Austin. And he closed with a solemnity that was profound. His closing sentence was, and now the Republic of Texas is no more. Although we all knew why we had gathered there, and we knew beforehand just what had to be done. The services were so impressive, and the speech of the president was so grave that when he said, and now the Republic of Texas is no more, the people acted as if they were stunned. The silence was broken only by the rattling of the ropes as our lone star of Texas, which had been floating from that flagstaff, came down. Then those two or 3,000 persons looked as if they were about to cry. There was a look of suffering on every face. The full significance of their act was brought home to, the, to them by that single act of hauling down the flag, the flag for which they had suffered so much and which meant so much to them. They were still in that unsettled, tremulous, deeply sentimental state when the man at the halyards began pulling at the ropes. And slowly but surely, another flag was hoisted on high. When it reached the top of that flagstaff, the stars and stripes of the United States burst into view. In a moment, that crowd, which had been as still as death, changed. A mighty cheer went up. Hats were thrown a high, cannon boomed, and there was tremendous tumult. Never before and never since have I ever seen such a sudden change from grief to rejoicing. It was marvelous. My friends, today I'm here to tell you it is marvelous. Thank you.